You're listening to an Airwave Media Podcast. Hello, Saver. Whether you're saving for that trip to the tropics or saving for an emergency, now is the time to take advantage of Wells Fargo's savings options. Wells Fargo offers savings accounts that can help you save towards your goals. So, what are you saving for? Visit a Wells Fargo branch or wellsfargo.com slash save to open a savings account today. Wells Fargo Bank, N.A., member FDIC. My name is Greg Jackson. I'm a Ph.D. holding historian, a professor, and the creator of History That Doesn't Suck, a podcast that makes legit, seriously researched American history come to life through entertaining stories. Join me for a chronological telling of the United States story, from the Revolution to fractious Civil War, tenacious inventors, brave reformers, and more. With more than 100 episodes, you can already binge listen your way from 1776 to the early 20th century. Listen to History That Doesn't Suck on Spotify. Hello, everyone, and welcome to History of the Second World War, Episode 124, The September Campaign, Part 16, The Advance on Warsaw. This week, a big thank you goes out to Mike Paul and a a long string of numbers that I won't recite for choosing to support the podcast by becoming members. You can find out more over at historyofthesecondworldwar.com slash members. At the start of the German invasion, the primary focus was to advance from both the north and the south towards Warsaw. The goal was to surround the Polish capital and then to capture it. And then after that objective was complete, they would then shift into dealing with whatever remained of Polish resistance, unless Poland surrendered, which was great if they wanted to. During the early days of the campaign, things were going roughly according to this plan. On almost every area of the front, German forces were advancing, and the Polish units were in retreat. It was at that point that the German military leaders sort of took their eyes off the prize of Warsaw. They were experiencing so much success, and so instead of sticking with the general plan of focusing on the capital, they decided to expand the scope of their attacks. We talked about one of these expansions back in episode 122, when troops were shifted from the corridor and into East Prussia to expand the scope of German advances to the east of Warsaw, and that trend would continue. This episode will focus on events around the capital, as the German invaders approached the city, were rebuffed in their early attacks, and then settled into a siege as the city was cut off and surrounded by German forces that were able to meet from the north and south to the east of the city. While the units were pushing to Warsaw, news would also arrive that Britain and France had declared war, and this placed a greater emphasis on finishing the attack into Poland as quickly as possible, with a message to the army being sent from Hitler, which stated, quote, I know that you are aware of the magnitude of the task before you, and that you are doing your utmost to speedily throw down the adversary as the first step, end quote. The risk of a war on two fronts, with so much of the German army committed to the attacks in Poland, was a huge concern. But if Warsaw could be captured quickly, it was very likely that the September campaign would be brought to a swift conclusion. To try and capture the capital, the Germans were advancing on Warsaw from a few different directions during their advance. From the northeast, the remaining divisions of the 3rd Army Corps uh, advanced along the north side of the Vistula River. This included three infantry divisions, which had attacked Army Pomorsha during the first phase of the offensive, and they were joined by two additional infantry divisions on the south side of the Vistula, which were also advancing parallel to the river, pushing the remnants of Army Pomorsha back towards Warsaw. The most important aspect of these five German divisions is that they were all infantry divisions, with German motorized and armored units focusing on other avenues towards the capital. This meant that they were slower than the other attacks, and it was in some ways this fact that had created the pocket of space that the remaining Polish units of the west to the west of Warsaw used to launch the Battle of, of Bazura, the, the Bazura counterattack that we focused on last episode. The units of the 1st and 21st Army Corps were then approaching Warsaw from the north. They had moved out of East Prussia in the opening days of the attack. By September 9th, they had either reached the Narav River or were quickly approaching the river, which brought them to within about 50 kilometers of Warsaw. What remained on this area of the front it was again primarily German infantry divisions, with all the German mobile units to the north of Warsaw focused on attacks further to the east. We will catch up with those attacks later in this episode. 
The most important German thrust on the city, though, was the one approaching Warsaw from the southeast. This was led by the 1st and 4th Panzer Divisions that had been advancing since the very start of the war. On the opening day of the offensive, these units had hit the Polish line where Army Wuj and Krakow met, and from that point forward they'd basically been off to the races. The speed of the advance of these two divisions had caught the Polish defenders off guard completely, allowing the Germans to capture some Polish units before they even really knew they were in danger. It had also allowed them to completely bypass obstacles that the Polish army had planned to use to slow an advance. The best uh, example of this might have been the River Vortha, which the 4th Division would cross before the bridges could be destroyed. The two German armored divisions would push mostly side by side throughout the first week of the campaign using a similar plan, very nicely summarized by Major Walter Wenck of the 1st Panzer Division. He was their operations officer. Quote, forward to the Vistula. What remains behind remains behind. As long as we have strength, the enemy will be attacked. End quote. Or to quote the 4th Panzer Division's commander, quote, We have not merely hit the enemy but driven him back in confusion in front of us, but we still have not yet reached our objective. Our objective is Warsaw. Forward to Warsaw. End quote. Now, as these two divisions approached Warsaw, they split and then would pursue different objectives. The 1st Panzer Division planned to push directly to the Vistula River south of Warsaw to complete the encirclement of the city from the east. They would cross the river and then move northeast. The 4th Division would attack it directly towards the city, moving into the Warsaw suburbs from the southeast. They would reach those suburbs on September 8th, a day before the Bajura counterattack. The attacks on September 8th into the city, into those suburbs, did not go well. The Germans were not sure how much opposition they would face in Warsaw, and what they found was determined resistance from the Polish troops in positions that they had been preparing for several days. But just because the first attack was repulsed did not prevent further attacks the next day on September 9th. On the 9th, the Germans would attack along a 5-kilometer front, during which they had to contend with all the problems of urban fighting. There were roadblocks set up by Polish soldiers and civilians that had to be cleared. There was the constant threat of small arms fire from surrounding buildings. Uh, Polish machine guns were well positioned to fire on German infantry. Uh, Polish anti-tank rifles were well positioned as well. All of this caused the German attack, which had at least a little bit of initial success, to slow as the German infantry were simply unable to keep up with the armored vehicles. Then the German tanks ran into Polish anti-tank guns, which in one instance would knock out seven German tanks in a matter of minutes. In total, the 4th Panzer would lose about 42 tanks just on September 9th uh, during these attacks against Warsaw. It was a costly mistake, and late in the morning the German attacks would be called off completely. This attack is somewhat interesting because I think it is the first time a large armored force had attempted to attack into an urbanized environment that was defended by at least reasonably well-armed troops, and most importantly, soldiers with machine guns and anti-tank guns. Obviously, it didn't go well for the Germans. The Polish resistance was so fierce that it caused the Germans to believe that they were even facing many more Polish defenders in the city than there actually were which would put a stop to direct attacks on the city for a short period, but it's a really good example of some of the challenges that even armored units faced once they moved into an urban environment where their mobility counted for very little inside of the, the confines of a city. While they were able to defend against the first set of German attacks, the Polish defenders in Warsaw were far from being fully prepared and ready to meet the German forces converging on the capital. The defense of the capital was put in the hands of General Rommel, who would command forces from three different sources. The first was the five infantry battalions that had been placed in the capital specifically to provide for Warsaw's defense. These were from the 5th and 29th Infantry Divisions. The second source of defenders was from within the city itself. These were partially made up of Polish reservists who had not yet been mobilized during the early days of the war, while the rest were simply civilian volunteers who lived in the city and wanted to help defend it. All of these individuals would be grouped into one new infantry regiment composed of four battalions. It was not the most capable fighting force in the Polish army, but it was something and it would acquit itself well over the following days. The final source of troops to help defend the capital were various units that were able to retreat to Warsaw in the face of the German advance. 
there were many units that would be able to retreat to Warsaw in a wide range of, of sort of sizes and, and organizations. These units, in whatever level of organization they were in when they reached the city, would have to very quickly prepare themselves for the coming German attack. While the natural course of action would have been to simply prepare the defenses of the city and wait for that German attack, there was at least some efforts made to enact a more active defense. On September 10th, some tanks of the 2nd Light Tank Company would attack out of the city and towards the northwest and Campino's Forest. This was done at the same time as the battle on the Bajura was reaching the height of its danger to the Germans, so, so the timing was actually quite good. They were able to destroy a few German tanks before retreating back into the city. The next day, a Polish counterattack would attack towards an airfield to the southwest of the city. However, when the Polish troops moved forward early in the morning of September 12th, they ran into a much greater sort of German resistance than they expected. This included the 31st Infantry Division and the 13th Motorized Infantry Division. The motorized infantry was particularly troublesome for the Polish tanks, which were unable to deal with the German anti-tank capabilities. The result was the loss of several Polish tanks and no real progress made towards capturing the airfield. It may sound dull, maybe even monotonous, but this is what miracles sound like. This is the sound of a child's surgery being performed by a robot. Our personalized care leads to miraculous things, like innovative procedures with less pain and faster recovery. Children's Hospital Colorado. Here, it's different. 400 years ago, a trio of tiny kingdoms were perched on some damp islands off the coast of Europe. Within three short centuries, these islands would become the centre of an empire which ruled a quarter of the globe and on which the sun never set. I'm Samuel Hume, a historian of the British Empire, and my podcast Pax Britannica follows the people and events that built that empire into a global superpower. Listen to season one to hear about England's first attempts at empire building in Ireland, in North America, and in the Caribbean, the first steps of the East India Company, and the political battles between King and Parliament. Listen to season two to hear about the chaotic years of civil war, revolution, and regicide, which rocked the Three Kingdoms and the fledgling empire. In season three, we see how Lord Protector Oliver Cromwell ruled the powerful Commonwealth and challenged the Dutch and the Spanish for the wealth and power of the Americas and Asia. Learn the history of the British Empire by listening to Pax Britannica everywhere you find your podcasts, or go to pod.link slash pax. While the situation around Warsaw was developing, General Bach, the commander of Army Group North, was trying to work through a, the problem of the lack of concentration of German forces. A key point of the German strategy over the previous days had been to push troops to the east of Warsaw to surround the city and prevent the escape of any Polish forces. This had required attacking across the Narov and then the Bug rivers. But almost immediately, the scope of these offensives continued to increase. Directly to the east of Warsaw, a critical clash would occur along the Bug River near the Polish town of Wyskow. This position was critical for Polish troops to hold, because it was the last real line of defense that could prevent Warsaw from being surrounded, and if the German troops were able to cross the bug, it would be unlikely that they would be prevented from advancing south and meeting up with the German troops on the other side of the Vistula River to the south of Warsaw. Four German infantry divisions would approach the river on September 9th, opposed by just two Polish divisions. The defenders never really had a chance, and in just a few days the Germans would cross the river and the Polish units would be forced to retreat to the southeast and away from Warsaw. This was unfortunate for the future defense of Warsaw and guaranteed that the city would be surrounded. The attacks along the Bug near Viskov were not the attacks causing the problems for Army Group North, though, this, this sort of over-expansion and, and um, stretch of their resources but instead it was the attacks occurring 100 kilometers further to the east. These attacks were being made by the armored and motorized troops of the 10th and 3rd Panzer, and then the 20th and 2nd Motorized Infantry. We discussed some of these attacks a few episodes ago, when the Germans crossed the Narov at Viznov, Lomza, and Novograd. 
In these areas, the Polish defenders did better than could have been expected in defending the crossings from German attacks, although in all cases they would eventually be forced to surrender or retreat. After the Narav was crossed, instead of moving directly south to threaten troops east of Warsaw, the Germans' plans continued to expand. Some troops began marching on Bialstok, uh, even further to the east, while most of the armored and motorized units began moving south and east towards Brest and Vodava, almost 200 kilometers south-southeast of Vizna. This was done for the reasoning that it would prevent Polish units from being able to regroup, which was a valid reason for pushing the attack forward. But the consequence was that German armies were spread very thin, and they kept moving further apart. And this prevented any real effort from being made directly against Warsaw, and it also meant that the cordon around Warsaw was quite porous, which over the course of the days after September 13th would allow more troops to enter the capital to bolster its defense. These Polish units that were able to make it to the capital and through the ring of Germans around the capital were kind of a mixed bag. There were a few thousand here and a few thousand there. For example, on September 13th, large pieces of the 20th and 21st Divisions would enter Warsaw from the north, having been part of Army Modlin, which had started the war on the border of East Prussia. On the other side of the city, 4,000 men who had been members of the 28th and 30th Infantry Divisions would reach Fortress Modlin. They had started as members of Army Wuj in southwest Poland. Fortress Maudlin, to the north of Warsaw, was a major beneficiary of the troops sort of retreating towards the capital due to its position northwest of Warsaw and along the Campinos Forest. Originally, the fortress and its surroundings had been defended by 15,000 troops, but this would swell with Polish units until the commander of the garrison, General Strome, had about 40,000 or so troops under his command. Up until the 16th of September, the two Polish garrisons, that being Fortress Maudlin and in Warsaw, were able to keep a corridor of territory free of German troops to allow for communication between the two areas, but this would eventually fall apart and would be overtaken by the Germans. But even after these two areas were cut off from one another, the troops in Fortress Maudlin still controlled around 30 square kilometers of territory. Unfortunately, for any troops that made it to Fortress Maudlin, that was pretty much the end of the road and they were stuck in defense of the fortress with little chance of anything other than dying in its defense or surrendering to the Germans. Everyone, uh, soldiers and civilians alike, were in a similar situation in Warsaw. The situation of the Polish soldiers and civilians trapped in Fortress Maudlin and in Warsaw was unenviable. During the first two weeks of the Polish campaign, there had been a number of atrocities throughout Poland, as both surrendering soldiers and innocent civilians were killed by the German troops. We've discussed several instances of German troops killing civilians and the Luftwaffe bombing Polish cities, but there were also many instances of Polish soldiers being killed after surrendering. When the German sources would report on these events, they would often refer to them in sort of ambiguous terms, trying to kind of shift blame away from the German troops, stating that the killing of Polish prisoners were mistakes or accidents, with nervous troops firing on suspicious-looking Polish prisoners. An example of this was the execution of 80 Polish prisoners near the Vistula River in the city of Topolno. The troops had surrendered to the 3rd Infantry Division's 8th Infantry Regiment before they were killed shortly after they were captured. There are always mistakes in war which result in unnecessary death, but it must be considered within the wider set of German objectives with their invasion of Poland. Before the invasion, lists of civilians were written up that would be arrested as the German forces advanced, with Einsatzgruppen uh, specifically designated to move into Polish cities and carry out the arrests. At the front, German units were ordered to arrest anybody who looked suspicious, which often resulted in men of military age or all men of military age being detained. When these official policies were combined with the constant propaganda around the inferiority of Polish individuals, the outcome where some Polish unarmed prisoners were killed uh, was almost expected. It's unclear if the soldiers and civilians in Warsaw knew of some of these events, but what they did know is that by September 16th, uh, further direct assaults on the city by the Germans were put on hold. There had been several direct attacks into the city by German troops over the previous days, but none of them had really been successful. This resulted in the order being given that all further major attacks would be suspended, and instead the German troops would settle into a siege. When this decision was made, the positions surrounded by the Germans were Warsaw, Fortress Maudlin, and then the areas of the Campinos Forest. 
The condition of Polish troops in the forest was rapidly deteriorating, as described by General Kutsriba after he arrived in Fortress Maudlin. Quote, It's dreadful what's happening in the Campinos. I've never been through anything like that. It's a nightmare. Hundreds killed and wounded, incessant fire, panic-stricken troops running in all directions without a purpose, always under enemy bombs. I don't know how I got out of that hell. End quote. But with major assaults on hold for the time being, the German units surrounding the city did little but launch raids into the city to keep the pressure on the Polish troops. But in these endeavors, the Polish defenders would always have the advantage. As described by Colonel Sosabowski, commander of the 21st Infantry Regiment, which was positioned in the southern Warsaw suburbs uh, on both sides of the Vistula River. Quote, we knew every street, every back alley, every garden. We had maps showing plans of the drains and underground cables. We knew every entry and every exit. My men could go where they pleased. The Germans never knew where we would strike next. End quote. They would then use this information to make nightly patrols of their sectors um, to ensure that the Germans had not tried to creep forward at any point during the previous day. While the soldiers on the ground had stopped their attacks on the city, from the air, the bombing of Warsaw continued. The number of German bombs dropped after September 17th would be increased to try and reduce the ability of Polish soldiers to defend and the Polish civilians to live. The amount of German artillery positioned around the city also continued to increase, with largely the same purpose. The German artillery shells at one point were landing in the city about one every minute. Within the city, along with the threat of constant German bombardment, was the simple threat of starvation. Food was a major problem in the city, which had absorbed large numbers of both soldiers and refugees trying to escape from the German advance. After the Germans had surrounded the city, external sources of food were cut off, and it was really only a matter of time before food in the city had been completely exhausted. One Polish civilian would write that, quote, if a horse was killed in the street, people queued to go at it with kitchen knives, end quote. This problem was known to the Germans, and it was an explicit reason that further attacks against the city were halted on September 16th. The Germans knew that they didn't need to be in a hurry. The only group of people allowed to leave Warsaw after the start of the German siege were foreign nationals, which would be allowed to leave the city on September 21st after the Germans announced that anyone holding passports to neutral countries would be allowed to leave. This allowed some foreigners to leave, for example, the staff of the U.S. Embassy, but all the Polish citizens that had worked in the embassy had to stay. All around the city, all the people who lived in the city were being affected by the war, whether it was through air attack or German artillery or attacks along the streets. One Polish nurse at a field hospital in the city would record what happened when some German units began advancing down a nearby street. Quote, I begin packing. They help barricade the windows. Hand grenades are handed out and we get them too. The captain walks up to me. Can you use a gun? This is for your personal use. And a small Belgian pistol falls in my pocket. Behind the barricade, soldiers with grenades, rifles, ammunition on hand, machine guns upstairs. All eyes are focused without fear. End quote. Throughout all of these events, one of the constants for the people of Warsaw was the daily radio broadcast from Stefan Storinsky which would be a major focus of many Polish accounts of the siege, with one poll writing, quote, No news carried with it more authority than that broadcast every day by Mayor Starinsky, whose daily talks to the populace were listened to with religious attention. In them, he spoke about current events, he educated the people, he heartened them to resist, he interpreted and explained the situation and exposed the lies spread by the German wireless service, end quote. But no matter how brave the people of Warsaw were, no matter how much they wanted to resist, no matter how stirring and inspirational uh, Starinsky's uh, radio broadcasts were, the situation in Warsaw was really only a matter of time. There was no chance of any relief for the city as, as what remained of the Polish army retreated to the southeast and away from it. Meanwhile, the final doom of Poland approached not from Germany in the west, but instead from the Soviet Union in the east, with the forces of the Red Army crossing the border on September 17th. <laughs> 